Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom and Ramon. Wow, we are recording this on uh, January 19th and 20th, 2014, and uh, we'll explain that 19th and 20th later. Well, I guess it isn't quite the 20th yet, is it? Not yet. Yeah, Almost. another... You, you, and the another, second segment... The second be. segment will be July, January 20th for at least one of us. Uh, so uh, we're, we're spanning the globe today, and... Uh, it's uh, it's uh, just a testament to the technology that we all have access to now. Uh, that we can that we can do shows like this, Ramon, with people in three completely different locations on the planet, and it's like we're sitting in the same room talking. It's just absolutely amazing. So I'm extremely grateful for uh, what we have done as a collective, as far as being able to reach out and communicate with each other and touch each other all the way around the world. It is just absolutely amazing. Um, so, anyways. Well, you, you know what they say, Tom, there's only one person really having a conversation. So, it's really not that far. So, it's only one place and one time. So, I'm just talking to myself? Yeah, the whole time. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, so Ramon, you had a couple things in the news section. What's going on, man? Yeah, um, let me start off. Um, first thing I have is the um, Code Fusion continues to progress steadily into the mainstream, and I'll go a little more into that. Um, basically, is just how you know the whole thing about Code Fusion is leaking out, but. You know, what surprises me is the whole thing they mentioned here with um, ECAT and how that is still like, you know, they've had scientists go there and tested. I'll read a little bit of it. Uh, Co-fusion, otherwise known as Low Energy Nuclear Reaction, or LENR, is fringe science, but it continues to regress steadily into the mainstream. The development, the development over the last few months have been in business rather than science, with focus shifting towards commercialization, uh, commercializing a technology. Claimed to be able to generate unlimited energy for cheap desktop sized reactors. Uh, the current wave of interest was sparked by the Italian inventor Andre, Andrea Rossi, who showed off his energy uh, catalyzer or ECAT in 2011. I'll stop there. But see what I mean? Even in this article, it's like um, they don't mention anything about the scientists and stuff like that. But it, it's not in the mainstream. But according to this article, it's getting there slowly but surely. Yeah, that's that's one that whole the ECAT thing. I mean, we've talked about it several times on the show, and we've actually done shows pretty much centered around that technology. And and it just it's what what baffles me about this whole thing Ramon is that it hasn't reached the market yet I mean it seems like every they, they're they're up against a tremendous amount of roadblocks to getting it to the the people you know to the mainstream yeah yeah it's, yeah uh, the average person knows nothing about it I mean uh, like here for example I couldn't find a, a news article on it at the moment but my wife is telling me about it how um, one of the guys, I think he's like, uh, was a senator or vice governor, I can't remember exactly. But, you know, a lot of other politicians are coming out saying, you know, we have to get rid of the whole nuclear thing here in Japan. But and then they don't talk about this technology. They don't talk about this technology, but he was saying, then he was saying, well, if we're going to get rid of the nuclear power plants, then we have to cancel the 20... 2020 Olympics in Japan, and that's like a big deal here. Hmm. Um, oh, so they're using they're using the nuclear power exactly. plants as leverage. Yeah. Well, the thing is, that he's kind of right. If they turn off all the power plants, they you know the government works so slow here that they won't have anything else. They do have other options, but right. it, and they know nothing about this technology. But anyway, let me move on to the. The next uh, news segment here. Um, the next uh, one is uh, in search for a habitable planet. Why stop at Earth-like? There you go, Tom. Hmm. Uh, okay, so in their hunt for potential habitable planets around distant stars, scientists have been so focused on finding Earth-like planets that they're ignoring the possibility 
that other kinds of planets might be even friendlier to life. A new report says so-called superhabitable worlds would uh, necessarily look like Earth, but would nonetheless have conditions that are more suitable to, for life to emerge and evolve, according to the study published this month in the journal uh, Astrobiology. Hmm. So, you know, that kind of reminds me of Star Trek. Yeah. I think everything reminds me of Star Trek. Yeah, it does. <laughs> well, you know, we, you know, I, ultimately, I think with our technology and uh, our level of consciousness growing at the same time, uh, I think we're we're moving towards that sort of society. You know, I think the whole Star Trek format, you know, that whole idea about a society based, um, you know, similar to what they have in the Star Trek era. Is, uh, is is actually pretty appealing to me. Maybe a maybe the Star Trek thing still has is a, a little heavy on the confrontational aspects of life, but but I think that's a uh, I don't know, at least in my world it kind of looks like a pretty good template for us to uh, uh, maybe one of the stepping stones towards getting to uh, you know where I kind of envision life going. But anyways. Here's here's uh, one that I I gotta put the link for it. I didn't put the link, but it's on uh, Facebook, and that is PayPal president says company believes in Bitcoin. So before, like you know, PayPal was really against it. I guess right. they're opening up to it now. Um, they might even start using it. But it's so many uh, big companies and they're, you know, are talking about Bitcoin, I think, especially with what Teal Scott said today, you know. Right. Um, I'm, I'm actually excited about Bitcoin I, and PayPal. I'm, I'm, God, I hope they start taking Bitcoin because that would make our, uh, the ability to, for us to do transactions through the website on, on Bit, with Bitcoin would be awesome. I'd love to be able to do that. I have just one more because, um, the, you know, I found a lot of news, but I don't want to bore you guys with so much news. But here's just one that I have to talk about. And uh, you probably heard of this, Tom, and a lot of people have been talking about this. This is a really big deal. And um, Snowden leaked docs proving aliens working with government, says Iran Far News, uh, January 16, 2014. Well, you know, that whole part that Iran says is not completely true. What happened was, I think, I forgot the name of some unreliable uh, small news source, internet news source. Um, they they said that, and I guess Iran picked it up, and then it became a big deal. Then all the major news picked it up. I don't know how true that is that Snowden leaked those documents, but they're talking about the tall whites, uh, Are they the ones from um, the human uh, ones, the human looking ones. They're not really that human looking. Um, they have semi like almond slash Asiatic eyes, but they're very white. Um, I mean, like very white, like powdery white albino type. Yeah, and they're really tall, like six, I think six to seven feet tall. And, and um, Colonel Corso, he talks about um, how the military was working with them and stuff like that. So those are the aliens that they're talking about. They, you know, in the major news, they put a picture of a gray, but that's completely wrong, and, you know. But um, what's amazing about this news, Tom, is that so many um, major media actually covered it. Really? Yeah, I yeah. Mean, you'll def definitely, it, you'll definitely sure. have to throw a link for that one up on the page. Uh, and yeah, it's I'll, I'll take a look at that one for sure. Yeah, I'm surprised you haven't heard about it. But anyway, uh, I heard something about it last week, and um, like so many of those things, I just kind of take them with a grain of salt, and and uh, because I because I didn't actually see it on any major media thing. So yeah, Fox actually was one of those uh, Washington Post, Fox. Hmm. I'd like to see the documents that were supposedly leaked. That would that would be something that I would be very Yeah, interested. well that's why everybody, you know, like on Coast to Coast they were talking about it how, you know, um there is no there's no proof and that 
website that first leaked it out is kind of unreliable. So, right. But um, like Michael Sala was saying, the good part about it is that it's in the public eye. You know, right. the right. major media is actually covering it, so it might open doors for more real information. Cool. But uh, cool. last one is there's a video I found of um, a guy who can use like magnets uh well he is like a magnet you know he takes pots and things and sticks it to his face russian guy hmm. and you know i posted this on my facebook and one guy had posted that his koreans he was teaching like uh english to korean students and you know they're all like nine and ten years old and a bunch of them can do it and he was like how do you do this and they said um well just become like a magnet so hmm. according, according just to that, be it yeah. just be that so that's what what's amazing was you know the, the facebook friend um posted that i was just amazed by that but anyway yeah i you know i saw something on the, on that same thing here joe's geez years ago uh it was some show on the discovery channel or something or other uh actually pretty damn amazing a guy was able to turn it on and off you know, so he'd have something stuck to him, and then just by his will, by his his conscious decision to not be a magnet, he's able to let the stuff just drop off him. It was pretty wild. Yeah, actually, I've heard stories here in Japan too. Uh, one girl was telling me a friend of hers was able to do that, but um, you know, like things like that, they'll just keep it quiet, not really talk about it. He's probably the only one going public, but there's probably a lot of people who can do that. Hmm. All right. Well, shall we get our get our uh, guest going here? Uh, bring her on. Yeah, here. before she has her afternoon nap, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've got a, a special treat for you guys tonight. We have Rhiannon Agenthaler, and I probably didn't pronounce that right, but I'll get that straightened out in a bit. Uh, Rhiannon has a background as a psychotherapist and massage therapist. She's been clairvoyant since birth and developed her ability to channel in her teenage years and continue to refine and deepen her cha cha channelings bleh, every since. <laughs> she has dedicated the past 17 years of her life to, to her spiritual quest and has traveled the world, lived and learnt in many, learnt in many cultures such as studying with Sami shamans in northern Lapland and then began teaching internationally. After having given many seminars, workshops, retreats, and one-on-one -on -one sessions for over 10 years, on an international basis to people from all walks of life in New Zealand, Austria, Germany, Portugal, Ireland, Thailand, Belgium, and the Canary Islands. Rhiannon is now channeling for groups in the UK as well as continue, continuing to work on an international basis. Her website is www.channeling-healing.com. Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio, Rhiannon. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Oh, this is fantastic. Did I pronounce your last name right? Augenthaler? Yeah, you've done really well there. You're natural. Yeah. Ah, well, well, my last name is German too, so I suppose that's uh kind of fits into my my own thing. So Right. Yeah, great. But do, you, do you pronounce your last name correctly, Tom? My last name? Yeah. I probably don't, but uh <laughs> Okay, that's uh, what I thought. Because well, Tom it's, is usually really bad at pronouncing names. It's, it's Kappenman. My last name's Kappenman, and that's the way they... Well, see, it's kind of strange about my name. When my ancestors came over to the United States, their name was Kapperman with an R. And at Ellis Island, there were two brothers that came over. And at Ellis Island, one of them, when they filled out the paperwork, they, instead of putting an R... They put an N, which happened to be my branch of the family. So we have one branch here in the in the U.S. called Cap Erman, and one branch that is Cap Inman. So kind of. Oh. That's probably a small price to pay, though, to get to be in the U.S. I wish my ancestors had done the same, because in the summer I loved it over there when I was in California, Oregon, and Washington. Yeah, so it's probably been a good move. Oh yeah, so. We met. I, I met Rhiannon at uh, Kepacha's Healing Festival here in Washington State at the East SETI Ranch, and uh, 
she actually did some amazing work while she was there, and it just enthralled me so much that, that we figured we definitely had to get her on the show and share what she is doing with our guests. Um, so, Rihanna, if you would, for our audience, uh, share uh, what actually prompted you to go off into this Field. I mean, it's not something that the common person is going to look into and actually pursue as a career. Yes, that's true. So what I do is at the moment mainly channeling and also out-of-body travel, astral travel and astral projection. And interestingly enough, I only remembered that I had done these things as a child when I was an adult consciously relearning this, getting back into it. So I did astral travel for years as a child, then as a teenager forgot all about it, and then as an adult the memories of it came back to me. So in a way it was more for returning to something from childhood without realizing at the time. So mm. in a way the two things go quite well together, channeling and out-of-body travel, because it's both multidimensional and one would be receiving information from the other dimensions, being a channeler and the information coming in and receiving answers to all sorts of questions. And the out-of-body travel then would be kind of the, if the channeling was yin, as in being receptive, then the out-of-body travel would be the yang, the exploration, the going out and exploring and penetrating the universe and traveling to all sorts of dimensions and I guess my reason for learning both of these skills was curiosity a real deep yearning for truth wanting answers but not wanting to just read it and having to believe other people, having to trust in external sources without having some form of proof or experience, personal experience. And, yeah, I wanted something that I know because, of I've, because I've experienced it rather than kind of more second-hand knowledge or dead knowledge in a way because I would have read it somewhere or someone else has told me and I'd believe it. So it was a search for experiences and truth and adventure and a lot of curiosity. Mm, yeah, it's uh, definitely a, a huge difference between uh, that knowing through experience and, uh, you know, intellectually knowing through um, uh, learning secondhand knowledge. Big difference there. I mean, and and I'm I'm much the same as far as that goes because I don't put anything into my I know bag until I have actually experienced it myself. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, was there something in while you were growing up that actually was sort of a catalyst to bring you back into this work? There's experiences I remember from childhood that probably. Yeah, it influenced me in that way. One experience was I had a broken leg and was having surgery. And I remember being in the surgery room, having these doctors putting metal in my leg and fixing the bone. And I remember being awake, hearing their conversation, even though, of course, I was having an injection and they'd put me asleep and I was having this operation but I remember seeing them being above my body seeing the cut open leg and I remember thinking how dare they joke while they operate on my leg they're supposed to concentrate not tell each other jokes and I was 12 at the time and then after the operation I told my mum oh you know I kind of saw the operation I was awake they were joking with each other that's what the whole thing looked like and she was like no 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 you're making it up it's not true and she didn't know what it was and only when I had conscious out of body experiences later in life did I realize wow that was an out of body experience 
and that was one of the experiences I clearly remember now, but I'd forgotten them completely. So a lot of our listeners today might have had out-of-body experiences as children or might have channeled as children and spoken to their angels, to their guides, maybe before they'd even learned to speak a language. Like often when I hear little kids kind of just doing their little baby language, I really do think they're probably really having the most interesting conversation with their guides or with beings we can't even see, and the adults just don't notice. Mm, yeah, Ramon works with children on a regular basis. He uh, teaches English there in Japan. And uh, I Ramon, English. yeah, Ramon, <laughs> well, yeah, chicken, chicken language, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, were you going to ask them? Uh, I was just going to say, Ramon, uh, why don't you share some? I mean, you've had some interesting experiences with those kids over there. Uh, I mean, they are. It's just absolutely fascinating what is being born onto this planet right now. As far as uh, it's well, just just, ama just amazing. There's one little girl in particular that I recently started teaching her, and, um, you know, they, she, she, it takes her a long time to try anything new and do anything new. For example, like, you know, her mother put her in piano lesson, and only after a month of taking piano lesson did she even start to try to touch it. So the whole time, the teacher's just showing her, but she's not even touching the piano. And she's the same way with English. Like she doesn't, she doesn't repeat anything. I, like she doesn't say a word. She just looks at me like I'm crazy. Um, but what's amazing about her is that for some reason I feel like very, when I'm around her, it's like almost like my psychic ability heightens. And I, I told her mother, I said, she's very psychic. She's very intuitive, very in tune to things. Like she doesn't talk, but she knows a lot more than you think and she goes you know you're the second person who says that uh the psychic told me that that when she gets older she's going to be a very strong psychic and then another time the grandmother was there and both of them together i was just like okay who's who's really psychic in your family and she says the grandmother said oh my mother and i said oh she's still alive and she goes yeah she's like 80 something but the the um I said, yeah, that's who your your granddaughter gets it from. Hmm. So Rhiannon, Rhiannon, what is it about the children today? I mean, I'm sure there's this is something that you may have uh, uh, talked to the the uh, guides and stuff about uh, the children that are coming into onto the planet now. Uh, they seem to be uh, of a different uh, different. Uh, I don't know, makeup than what we've had on the planet previously. Mm. What's, go what's going on there? Oh, yes, absolutely. Probably not all of them, but certainly a lot of them. I channel like all sorts of different beings, as well as the guides are also channeled over the last few years. They called themselves like the new children or the new generation. And so I channeled the like part of the group consciousness of the new children that are coming in and that are going to come in and they were telling me and the group I was channeling for a little bit about who they are and what their plans are and it was a very very high vibration a very positive vibe very very positive energy and they were as they were describing themselves and talking about themselves, they were saying that a lot of them had had lives on other planets. So it ties in quite nicely with what Ramon was touching on earlier in the news about connecting with other planets and beings from other planets. So these children have been trained in planets that are way ahead of us on Earth, and they're now coming here to help because we've really gotten ourselves into a bit of a difficult situation on earth with everything that's going on environmentally etc so they're coming in with gifts and talents and skills and training whether it's technology or healing or psychic arts or all sorts to yeah to help us clean up our mess on the planet which is in a nutshell what they were getting into in our conversation hmm. yeah, let's see 
What yeah, what exactly, you know, we we talk about the ascended masters and and all these different guides and stuff. What exactly are or is an ascended master? What is an ascended master? What's it take to become one? I want to be yeah, an ascended master. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a really good one. So in a way, we're all on our way to becoming ascended masters, kind of whether we like it or not. And some of them, or some of us, we might resist and take longer and not really want to and block the process. And others might do it in a bit of a speedier way. But basically, an ascended master would be a soul, a being who's been a human loads and loads and loads of times on planet Earth and they've learned absolutely every lesson there is. They've been everywhere, done everything, tried out everything, being the good and the bad and everything in between and busted through their illusions and woke up and eventually there's absolutely nothing more to do or to learn on the planet. They'd get a little bit bored maybe and then they decide, right, that's it. I'm not going to do another round. I'm not going to have another incarnation. I'm done now. I'm not going to have another birth and be a baby again and grow up and learn more things. I've done it all. Now I'm going to remain on the higher dimensions that are of a higher vibration, much less dense, much less physical, and I'm going to learn some more. I'm learning about other stuff now. I'm not going to have a physical body. I'm just going to be consciousness. And everything I think manifests in the moment I think it. So if I think of a place, next thing I'm there. If I think of another place, next thing I'm there. And as they have this heightened ability, they can then help us and guide us, give us information, be our older brothers and sisters, and learn and evolve and grow in that way. And when they describe who they are, they always say, well, we're still not very highly developed. There's other higher beings in even higher dimensions who are much more ahead than us. And they describe themselves maybe as like preschool children, and we'd be even younger than that in terms of evolution generally in the universe so they are still on their way of of ascension of growth of developing and they always describe them as our older brothers and sisters and they wouldn't want to be addressed as kind of parental figures so when we channel them they wouldn't want to tell us how we should live and what we should do and give us all the answers they're more kind of there to inspire us and give us a little bit of input but they wouldn't want to direct us or be like a master as in the old school where we are the student they're the master and we just do what they say that's not their game they're much more interested in just witnessing us doing our own self-mastery and staying very responsible for ourselves. Hmm. So, you know, it's something that's, that's popped into my mind several times uh, as I've contemplated the, the Ascended Masters. Uh, you know, what's, what's, it, what's it like a day in the life of an Ascended Master? I mean, uh, do they sleep? Do they uh, get up in the morning and have a coffee? Do they have bad days? Do they have bad days and good days? I really uh, like that question. No one has <laughs> actually ever asked me that. And I've been channeling by now for it's like 20 years or something. But no one ever asked me whether the Ascended Masters ever have a bad day. That there we go. That is a really, really cool question. I like that. I really like that. My feeling about it is probably not as our bad days because one of the consciousness shifts they've made as they've ascended is they've gone beyond this whole judgment of duality so they wouldn't judge as good and bad and you know the whole kind of polarity thing they'd be very much in unconditional love and in acceptance of 
themselves and life and existence. Because one thing they talk about a lot is the main thing we're supposed to learn is to really, really, really love ourselves totally unconditionally. To not only love ourselves when we've just achieved something and we've had a major breakthrough in whatever it is we do and then we like ourselves for five minutes but then we're trying already to achieve the next big goal. And they're saying, no, just love yourself when you're lying in bed in a grumpy mood. It's all gone wrong that day. Just love yourself. And that be one of the main important priorities in a human life, to have that truly unconditional love for ourselves and then for others. So I guess them then having mastered that, they wouldn't label anything a bad day, even if they stay in bed all day sort of thing. Yeah. Hmm. Well, one of the, um, you know, when Tom was asking that question, one of the things that came up in my mind, like, you know, let's say... He's kind of new at, at being a guide, you know, one of these uh, masters, and he does something. Let's say he gives somebody a symbol, but they completely misinterpret it, and they go off and, and you know, just go a complete wrong way or... Screw it all up. <laughs> yeah, or they end, up, they end up causing, like, a, a massive, you know... Uh, problem for so many mm -hmm. different people and that's not w what you know his intention was his intention was mm -hmm. for him to look at the symbol because people misinterpret things all the time of course just, so uh, that's that to mm. me would be a really bad day for you know <laughs> a guy to... maybe maybe that could give them a really bad day sometimes i do wonder how does Jesus feel about, you know, everything that happened since the churches have been created and all the killing and the wars and misunderstandings of the last thousands of years? So I do wonder whether that's giving him a headache at times. So that would be an interesting thing to ask in a channeling. But I think mm. the overall take on this is that there isn't such a thing as a bad situation that absolutely everything is learning and that we can't possibly ever make a wrong choice because even if we do something that's completely wrong and we've hurt ourselves doing it or even hurt other people there's still been so much learning in it for us and for everyone involved otherwise we wouldn't have even chosen it in the first place and they often talk about the main thing is, while we're here, we learn stuff, we experience things, and it's not about getting it right. It's just experiencing ourselves and giving the divine the opportunity to experience itself through us. So it can't be wrong, and when we're attached to an outcome, we could really, really suffer. But when we're kind of not so attached, just witnessing what's happening, it's not so bad and of course it's easier for them I often think than for us because they're not in the physical they're just consciousness but us down here in the physical of course we can feel pain a lot more or fear all these unpleasant emotions so it always yeah sometimes I think it makes so much sense but to live it on a daily basis can still be quite challenging hmm yeah, and mm. as as far as them, is there like, um, how can I wear this? They do they have like the same thing where you know even let's say we reach tomorrow, you know we become masters. Mm -hmm. At that at that level, is there still more to learn? Is there that challenge? You know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're always okay. putting it like we're only just beginning. Like if we are sort of the toddlers and they're at preschool, then there's still all the rest of it to do to become a grown-up. So they'd still see themselves as at the bottom of the ladder and they'd look up to maybe beings who have gone to mastery schools on other planets or in higher dimensions that are not physical. And there's loads and loads and loads more to learn. They describe it as 
if they'd want to comprehend existence or the divine, and the divine was like a big piece of cake, then they've seen one slice of cake, but the rest of the cake is still to be discovered. So they're mm. still learning. Mm. Yeah, there, there's been a um, in the last few years. There's been quite a quite a bit of talk about uh, the ascension of humanity as a whole, you know, the whole collective ascending into the next level. Uh, there's been a lot of different things that have been thrown out there. Uh, I was actually uh, doing a uh, an actual physiological transformation, turning into uh, what some people have called the light body or uh, uh, a homo luminous or, or, you know, there's a lot of terms that have been thrown out there. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious on, in, in all the channelings that you've done, mm -hmm. uh, what is the, what is the general, uh, uh, view on how humanity is ascending? Is it a, an individual basis or is there also a collective element there that, that we are all moving towards? Mm. Yeah. It's coming through as both. It's a collective experience as well as an individual. It's kind of like even if the individual resists and doesn't want to ascend, it's still happening to an extent because we're all dragging each other along. And then we could choose to maybe walk ahead a little bit and clear the path for the others to make it easier for them if they're not too decided whether or not they want to give it a go and we could also decide to just go along but not make it our main focus so there's different ways of going about it either consciously proactively and then it's faster and would probably experience the benefits more consciously or we could do it slowly and just follow along and if we do it consciously it could be a lot more fun and then there's self-chosen growth but if we do it unconsciously we might grow more through the hard knocks of life like through really difficult challenging experiences that probably a lot of us who are here today can really relate to like sometimes we would have grown the most in life if we've gone through a really 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 hard time and then we'd be so much more evolved after that than before but it's not the most fun. And if we choose to stay awake or wake up and then stay awake and consciously grow, we might not need these heavy knocks of life as wake-up calls, if that makes sense. Mm, yes, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, what, about a, uh, what about a physiological change? Uh, the, uh, you know, are we changing uh, the physical being? Is it changing and transforming at this time too? Yes. Like for a while there was a lot of talk going on about ascending and then eventually we descend and take the physical body with us to the non-physical right away but that's changed now as in we descend in our consciousness and our body transforms as we go along and it's very very important to ascend on all levels simultaneously to do it spiritually emotionally mentally physically energetically on all levels because what I've witnessed a lot, and in my sessions it comes up a lot with clients, where they just work on one area, say just the spiritual, and they meditate for hours every day, and they have their out-of-body experiences, and they channel, and they do all sorts of spiritual things and evolve beautifully in that field. But all of a sudden they notice their body is absolutely falling apart and disintegrating. So what doesn't work is to really raise our vibration just spiritually, but physically we'd mistreat our body, like we'd never exercise, we wouldn't get any fresh air, we'd just eat fast food and fried foods and chips and that sort of thing every day, but our consciousness really goes up. Then the body would rebel against that much stronger than if our consciousness vibrates on that lower level without ascending without the spiritual work and meditation so if we do all the inner ascension it's so important to 
adjust physically and have healthy foods and really take very good care of our bodies. Mm, you know, something I notice within my own self is that as as I as my consciousness continued to progress and and this has really been a very apparent to me here in the last few years uh some things happen physiologically for me as as you know I start to understand and have these experiences and seem to, to and have a, a certain level of knowing about about life and about who and what we are um my I started getting to a point where I was only sleeping and I'm still doing this now I'm I sleep but four to six hours a night and I the the food that I eat the it has just I used to eat like meat five times a week uh, now I'm surprised it's surprising if I have meat once mm -hmm. a week mm -hmm. and the I and just the the types of foods that I'm attracted to now have gone to the much more natural and the more organic and mm. and I am I am trying to be very conscious about you know what with, with all the crap that's out there the GMOs and all that stuff I'm try I try to be very conscious about what I'm putting into my body now and it's not really a <clears throat> excuse me it's not really a uh, intentional focus I I guess uh, it's the right way to put it it's more of something that's kind of uh, uh, naturally, uh, just kind of organically developed mm. for me as as I continue to grow spiritually and consciously. Uh, is this? Have you, are you seeing this as a common thread out there? Yes. Is this yes, absolutely. I witness that very much with myself and with people I work with, people I channel for, and yeah, with the groups of people I come in contact with through this work, and. I'd see it as the more sensitive we become energetically and spiritually, the more sensitive our bodies become as well. And maybe in the past we would have been a bit numb to a physical reaction to unhealthy foods and wouldn't have really noticed and we would have chosen to not pay any attention to our physical reactions. But right. as we would become more awake we really notice how different foods make us feel and the huge difference it makes to have like organic superfoods versus GMO fast food or something. So you'd really feel after you've eaten one or the other, you feel your immediate physical response and I'd see that just as part of being alert and awake and also increased level of self-love. When we don't love ourselves, we probably don't care what we put into our body, but when that unconditional love is there, it's like really, really caring for ourselves wakes up naturally. Mm. I'm kind of seeing this, uh, uh, and and this is just an idea, and and right at this point, and I really have no uh, uh, scientific basis or proof on this, but looking at those those changes that have happened within me, as far as what I'm looking at and what I'm eating, what I'm doing, you know, for the physical care of my body. Um, I'm I'm just wondering if this is kind of like the the uh, uh, the frog in a pot type thing, you know, slowly but surely I'm, I am, I am starting to, I'm starting to change, uh, physiologically, maybe moving towards a different type of, uh, or different type of human being on mm -hmm. this planet, uh, uh, kind of along the lines of, uh, oh, geez, what the heck is it? Um, oh, don't. damn it. I hate it when I do this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, geez, I just yeah, threw a blank. You're probably, I hate it when that happens. You're probably talking about the like the DNA changes and our bodies evolving. And our right. Oh, oh, I got it. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, you know, we have these people out here, out in the world right now, uh, the breatharians. Have you heard of the breatharians? Oh, these people are yes. existing on, on yeah. just energy. Yeah. I, I'm, just, I'm just, you know, when I look at, at what kind of transmit formation I've gone through there I'm just going I, and the question pops into my mind wow am I heading towards uh, the at least the ability to, to just exist on energy itself mm, yeah that is an option I've met quite a few people who've gone through that 
process of becoming breatharian and i find it very impressive like personally i'm not there at all yet at the moment i enjoy food way too much but i like the you know being able to and just living off light living off that energy and that is something that some of the ascended masters have done before in the process of ascending and others haven't so it seems to be something optional and it seems to go hand in hand you know with how people keep talking about choosing to get younger again as mm -hmm. now on the ascension path so it seems to go along and certainly i visit uh, i um witness people you know the the density of the food changing from denser foods to lighter and lighter food like some would go from eating meat to vegetarian to vegan to raw vegan to juicing to it seems to be like this gradual progression of changing to higher vibrational foods hmm. yeah. yeah the the, uh, the only thing i, I <clears throat> because I've gone the uh, vegetarian thing and then bounce back and eat meat again. The, the one thing I find that with a lot of the people on that progression, yeah, I would say a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people is that they get what I call this religious complex where mm -hmm. it's like, oh, you eat meat? <clears throat> or, you know, it's like, you still cook your food? <clears throat> you know, it's like... Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. That can definitely be very judgmental and very much the opposite of unconditional. So I think it's so important to not make a kind of cult or something like that out of the whole food thing or lifestyle thing and to focus a lot on the actual inner qualities of just witnessing oneself and noticing when a self-judgment comes in or judgment of another person or the whole polarity thing of better than and worse than and, yeah, not miss the whole idea of our inner development by becoming obsessed about food or really judgmental about how other people live or how we live or something like that. That's definitely a very good point. Hmm. Yeah. Because, you know, with me, it's funny, I guess, um, and, and I'm not promoting this, you know, mm -hmm. for those of you who are vegetarians or vegans, that's great. But because I, it's hard for me to get certain, like, uh, meat products, like, you know, a steak is really expensive here, or there's no such thing as bacon, so when I do get it, it's just like, I go crazy over it. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I mention it is because I remember I posted a picture of, you know, having a, um, this certain type of sausage that's from Dominican Republic and certain things. And, and one person posted on Facebook like, oh, that's so unhealthy. And I was like, you know what? I don't care because I never get to eat it. <laughs> oh. So if I have it once every two years, I don't think it's mm. going to kill me or even affect Exactly. Me. And sometimes we crave the most what we can't have or what we don't allow ourselves to have. And it could be, yeah, just the opposite of beneficial to deprive ourselves. And then all we'd think about would be just that very thing that we don't allow ourselves to have. So it makes perfect sense the way you're yeah. Yeah, approaching that. And it's yeah. also a good thing to not push ourselves to artificially be ahead of ourselves, to kind of try to be someone we're not and try to fit a particular picture. I don't think that's necessary at all on the path of ascension or development, however we want to call it, but to just stay ourselves and be ourselves and love that rather than be obsessed about being who we'd naturally be maybe in some years down the road. Yeah, you know, yeah. well, there's that's a double-edged sword, though, because there's, I know that there's been certain things in my own life where uh, things that I wanted to change about myself or or things that I wanted to understand or learn deeper within myself, and to do those things, I had to actually adopt a certain attitude or change something, and it took a very conscious effort on my part to be something that it wasn't naturally just flowing from mm. me. Uh, so, like, and and this is something that's uh, uh, 
I, it's uh, very present for me right now is because I'm working. Be out the I'm time, being, something else. Right. I'm working very hard on, uh, well, I'm working on uh, being very conscious about what I project into the world, you know, uh, drawing on that, the, the fundamental principles of, of cause and effect, manifestation. I'm, I'm, really trying to be very conscious about the the polarity of what I express uh, mm -hmm. you know whether I'm putting out something that's positive or negative uh, even in my casual conversation so mm -hmm. to to a certain extent I am I am not doing and and saying and acting how I would naturally or or organically react to situations mm -hmm. but I'm being very meticulous about how and what I'm saying and projecting into the world. So mm. I suppose that's a, that's the exception to that rule of not being quote unquote mm -hmm. yourself uh, for a, a specific purpose. Now, mm -hmm. I, granted, I understand that this could go to extremes and become a uh, uh, become something that turns into a, a, a negative. But in this sense, I actually feel this is a very positive thing for me. Yes, yeah, I agree with you. And at the same time, I've also been contemplating that lately because I've seen so many people taking, you know, the balanced way you've just described to an extreme, right. doing it in such an extreme way that I wondered whether that is still balanced. You know, when it comes to a point where people are so, when they get nearly a bit paranoid that any negative thought they might think or any negative statement they say might manifest and have a huge negative impact in their lives mm -hmm. to a point where then people would suppress anything negative, any negative feeling, any negative thought, any negative emotion and force themselves to be artificially positive all the time to a point where it become inauthentic right. and where nothing negative can be accessed anymore. And I reckon at that point, people can easily get sick because they suppress everything and they pretend to be positive, 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 to not manifest negatively. And then, yeah, that's just lacking authenticity, right. like if you do it to that extreme. So I do find there is a place for feeling and expressing whether it's fear or anxiety or any form of negativity that could naturally come up in our human existence. Because probably some of us try so hard to be spirit that we neglect our human self. And to find that balance between being spirit, being the manifester, being positive, and just being a very delicate, vulnerable human being, that seems to be quite a daily exercise of authentically expressing both and giving both some space. Yeah. You know, what I've done, and I think this is, uh, uh, this, this may be the one aspect of the way I'm approaching this that, it, that has, is keeping me in balance is that I'm not resisting any negative expressions or negative, uh, uh, you know, what I'm putting out into the world. There, there's, there's negative events and stuff that I am still addressing. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't just ignore these things yes. and go positive, yeah. positive, 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 you know, no negative, mm. no negative. But what I'm doing is I'm taking, taking, uh, Say my express say uh, the reaction I would have is ah go to hell you know instead mm -hmm. of just saying ah go to hell I'm actually looking at what I actually want to say and mm -hmm. seeing if I can find different words that have a different energy and different vibration with mm -hmm. them that express the same thing. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And maybe additionally what I'm kind of sensing or often encourage people to do in sessions as well is for all of us to be with our emotional bodies as well because especially for us who've done all the spiritual thing and the consciousness evolution with a lot of people on our path 
there's probably a bit of disembodiment going on. And then if we'd all get back into our bodies, back into our feelings, and still feel the feelings attached to the negative events, for example, what we talked about earlier with, you know, what happened in Fukushima, for example, to feel the grief around that, to mm. not be just in our mental bodies, but to feel the emotions, whether it's fear, whether it's grief, and to kind of offer that up as some people would get a negative connotation with prayer, so it's probably not the best of words, but to really offer our emotional bodies and our authentic human selves as well as the positive expression to reintegrate the negative or the emotional as well as everything else to make it a human experience as well as a consciousness adventure. Mm. Oh, yeah, that makes so much sense. Uh, I mean, yeah. you have to have, if, you, if it's a negative event that's happened and mm. it's traumatic in some form or fashion, mm. it has to be expressed. We have to experience those things. I mean, otherwise, mm. otherwise uh, this stuff builds up and we end up blowing up, you know. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Imploding. Yeah. yeah, and there's been so much, like in the our new age scene, or however we want to call it, there's been so much talk going on about don't think negatively or you'd manifest the negative, that for so many of us it's become scary to feel the impact of such events and to feel the emotions around that. And that's then quite a loss and like a big part that's missing. So to still have that and know just because I'm feeling what's going on doesn't mean I'm manifesting more of it. To have that discernment to, to not go into our light bodies and out of our bodies so much that we're just in that positive manifestation vibe and kind of avoiding the physical a little bit. Right. Mm. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of the um, questions that I wanted to ask was the, um, you know, the the difference between, like, not difference, but, uh, for example, you have the spiritual realm, and sometimes you have these very spiritual people who see things, and then they explain them, and everybody goes, huh? And they have mm -hmm. no no idea what you're talking about. And then maybe mm -hmm. a thousand, two thousand years later, you know, some scientist comes around and shows exactly what they were talking about. Like, you know, oh, you know, reality is made of these small little things. Mm. And then, you know, for example, um, one thing I've n noticed in the last hundred years is uh, for the reason why I br bring this up is the rising of consciousness. It almost seems like technology and science helps raise that that consciousness to the next level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quantum physics came around and then now people understand what those sages and gurus were talking about you know, mm. thousands yeah. of years ago. Yes, it's a little bit like thousands of years later, we finally receive the scientific proof. Right. Finally, right. like our left brain gets the food that we were previously not having. It's a bit like our right brains, our intuitive, mystical part of the brain might have known all along, might have felt it all along, intuited it all along, that our gut feeling was, yes, these mystics and prophets from the past are right, but we didn't have the proof. And then science is a bit behind of the all prophets the words and the mystics. As well. Yeah, exactly. And so now we're catching up on that. It's like now our collective left side of the brain is catching up with the right side of the brain, which with what had been out there all along. It's more like now we can prove what we felt deep down was the truth. All right. That's one aspect of, of what we're doing now with uh, in the scientific community. Is and uh, mm. and that is just absolutely uh, so encouraging to me that, um, I mean, every time I see one of these new new studies or uh, validations or something come out through the scientific community, I'm just like cheering, going, mm. "Yeah, all right, way to go!" Uh, yes. So, 
I just it just it just makes me really happy to see uh, that validation coming through for the left brainers. So, yes. Because every, every one of every single one of those things that comes out uh, brings more people into the fold, so to say. Uh, you know, it brings more more people to another uh, the to out from from outside of the realm of possibility to inside the realm of possibility. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because once our left side of the brain has been fed with information, then we can relax and trust the experience. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, you know, what's hard for me to understand is, and it's probably, you know, my way of thinking, but it's the whole idea of that this is impossible because throughout our whole history, we just keep proving that, no, it is possible. Right. No, well, well, that's impossible now. And then, like, no, wait, it is possible. It's yeah. we're doing it now. And then it's like mm-hmm. a, a, as soon as soon as somebody says it's impossible, the universe starts working on proving that it is possible. Mm, yes. <laughs> like for example, flying and and you know going breaking the sound barrier and things like that. Yeah, all these mm-hmm. things that have been oh, it's impossible. Then all of a sudden, here it is. Okay, well, we have we have burned up the first hour already, if you can believe that. And uh, so uh, maybe when we come back, Rian, and uh, we can get you to uh, uh, go in and uh, access some of these guides for us. And uh, yeah, that'd be fine. That'd be great. Yes. Cool. All right. Anyone in particular you'd like to hear, or whoever comes through? I think we'll go uh, for whoever comes through, unless yeah. Ramon right. has somebody he wants to talk to specifically. Um. Anybody who can give me a free spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, if not, then anybody who comes through. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> okay, guys. Great. So we'll be back in like five minutes or something? Yeah, so uh, I want to thank everybody for listening to this first hour. And uh, if you're not a member yet, I would urge you to uh, go over to www.100thmonkeyradio.com and sign up to become a member and help support Ramon and I and all that we do. Also, uh, Rhiannon's website is uh, uh, it is channeling-healing.com, and I would ask you, I also urge you to pop over there and take a look at her site. She's got uh, some amazing material on there, and she also offers channel uh, uh, private sessions and, and all sorts of different stuff. So, yeah. Also, Tom, we forgot. Um, now we have a special going on for one month. Uh, I think by the time this air, my birthday either passed or is coming up. I can't remember. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So for this one month, so starting today to um, February 25th, we'll have, for those of you who are not members, it's a lifetime membership um, for only 100 bucks, and that will only last for a month. So as long as we keep doing this show... You become a member and you don't have to pay anymore, and that's a hundred bucks. For those of you who are already members, we'll let you know about that in the member section. We're also hooking you up. So awesome, good stuff, good stuff. All right, guys, uh, we're going to uh, let Perry Mills. Uh, oh, geez, what song? Uh, just, just, uh, just tell me the truth is the song we're going to be using here, and we're going to let yeah, him take Tom. us out. And I, I kind of remember Ramon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friends. Namaste. Condemnation without investigation is a height of ignorance. The love you deny is the pain you carry. And we'll see you in the second section.